Isn't that good? I can. Or, or you hit return. But I can, I can wing without a pointer. Oh, well, there's a laser pointer here. I'll get it. Okay. okay. Do you see it up there? Ah, very good. Thank you. Okay. Into bottom button's the laser, and the other's just forward and back. Okay, great. Um, hi, I'm Steve Baird. I'm um, from Adicore, and uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, CodePeer, which is a static analysis tool for Ada programs. Um, Dan Sachs was saying earlier that it's a good thing to uh, to turn um, potential runtime failures into compile time failures, and that's certainly what the goal of um, a lot of stack analysis tools, including CodePeer, is. Um, Ada defines a uh, a lot of runtime checks, not just uh, you know numeric overflow and uh, array indexing that sort of thing, but also a fairly rich set of user-defined assertions, and CodePeer. You can use CodePeer to, to look over your program and flag the uh, assertions, flag the runtime checks that it feels might potentially fail at runtime. The uh, CodePeer is, is implemented using uh, an approach called abstract interpretation. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about um, a little bit about just the general model of what is abstract interpretation, how does that work, um, and how does it compare to some other alternatives. But then I'll most of the talk I'll focus on how CodePeer in particular um, deviates from the sort of standard model and uh, how, it how it's different and, and why, what the benefits are. And um, so abstract interpretation in general, and this is, there's, as I said, there's, there's a lot of static analysis tools that are based on this approach, um, involves well, imagine you're looking at a uh, sub-program that references, say, five, um, var five variables. Uh, then you could uh, characterize the state, the, the, po the possible state that it might be in at some point during the execution of that, um, um, that sub-program as in terms of the, uh, the Cartesian product of the, of, the, of, of, the f of the possible sets of values of each of the five variables. And so you get a, a, a five-dimensional space and, um, and then abstract interpretation is, tries to identify a subset of that space, of that universe of possibilities that's possible at any given point in the, during the execution of the subprogram. Um, now I could uh, illustrate this with uh, an example that uses 37 variables, but I didn't bring the special glasses that allow displaying 37 dimensional polytopes on the, uh, on the slide, so we'll, we'll focus here on an example with, with two variables. Um, Let's suppose that you have two variables, <laughs> x and y, and somehow or other, you know that x is in the range one to eight, and you know that, whoops. Gotta go back. <coughs> and you know that x is in the range one to eight, and you know that y is in the, also in the range one to eight, and you also happen to know that uh, two times y is greater than x. Maybe you're inside of an if statement, and, and th 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 that was the condition of the if statement. It said, you know, if two times y greater than x, and now you're analyzing the, uh, the then arm of the, if sta of the if statement. So you have this, inf this information available. And you, and you can uh, represent that. In this case, it would be a two-dimensional space, which is much better suited to the slides. Um, uh, you've got the, the constraints on, on x are, are represented with the, uh, the two vertical lines. The constraints on y are represented with the horizontal lines and the uh, and the constraint that two times y is greater than x is, is the, the sloping line. And, um, and then the, the integer valued points within that region are the, uh, are the possible states that the program might be in based on this the amount of knowledge. And the point I want to emphasize, because we'll come back to this later, is that we're talking about the set of variables. That, that's the, the, we're capturing information about the set of variables and combinations of values that the uh, that the variables might have. And um, just to look at, to step back a minute and say, how does, how does uh, uh, abstract interpretation fit in with other approaches? Uh, well, there's sort of three, desi three desirable properties that a static analysis tool might have. You'd like it if it didn't have any false uh, negatives, which means that if it finds something to complain about, uh, 
pardon me, if it, which, which means that if it didn't find anything to complain about, if it's silent about some check, then that means, in fact, it really won't fail at one time. It, 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 it didn't, and then you'd like it if it didn't have any false positives, which is where uh, it complains and says this might, fa this, might, uh, this might fail, but in fact it, is, it couldn't possibly fail. It's just the tool was not able to figure that out. And then you'd like it if it didn't require a lot of human intervention. You'd like it if you could just feed it things, feed it your source, and it would chug on it and, and, and grind on it until it's, uh, but without any further help from you. And it turns out you can sort of have any two out of those three. Uh, model checking, which is, um, a, for example, there's the spin model checker. Uh, you, you can have, it's, it's fairly automatic, and you don't get false uh, positives, but you can get false negatives because it, um, it just does a bounded number of iterations as, as it's processing. Um, it, it, uh, it, it goes through and, and sort of executes the, the program, but, but after a certain number of loop iterations, it just uh, stops and says, well, if I haven't found problems by now, it's, we're, we're probably, you know. And it has to do it that way because it gets the state explosion. Um, and on the other hand, um, there's the <coughs> deductive approach, which is uh, using formal proofs. And, and, and Spark 2014 is an example of that. That's another project that I work on. Um, and there, uh, if you, at least if you choose to look at it correctly, if you choose to look at it a certain way, um, you don't get false positives or false negatives, but it requires a fair amount of human uh, assistance. The idea is that what you might think it was a false positive because you have some verification condition that needs to be proven to prove that, say, for example, um, the bound for some array indexing operation is, is in the proper range. Um, and, it, and say it couldn't prove it. Well, that just means you're not done yet. You have to essentially provide more assertions that act as uh, lemmas to help it um, uh, you know, prove what needs to be proven. And so, um, so you know, no false, if, at least if you look at it, view it that way, it, no false positives, no false negatives, but a lot of uh, audience participation. Um, and, and so the, with abstract interpretation, we get the third combination, which is um, no false negatives, no, uh, and it works fairly automatically, but you can get false positives. Um, and the problem here is that you get, if you just, literally did what I've described so far, the, uh, the, set, the set becomes just impossibly large to represent for many very simple uh, examples. And so simplifications are used in practice. And in particular, one common one is to uh, represent, you have this, this, you're trying to represent this, this region in n-dimensional space. Um, and so the, it, you can represent it as a um, convex polygon so that what happens is if you're trying to represent, it's sort of, you, you, you can represent, you take the, the set that you'd really like to represent and then compute the convex hull and, and, uh, and then for example, suppose you have, here's a set of states that you might be in when you're processing one arm of an if statement. And here's the set of states that you might be in when you get to the end of the other arm of the if statement. And now you're asking, well, what states might I be in at the join point you know, after the two arms of the if statement come back together? And so you would, you take the union of the two sets, but if you're using this uh, convex polygon simplification, then you take the two sets, you, you take the union, and then you take the, uh, uh, the, 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 the nearest enclosing convex polygon, essentially the, the, the convex hull that, um, that encloses the ball. And, th and that introduces imprecision. You get points, you, you've now got points in, the, in your region that aren't actually possible. And there's a lot of different uh, techniques to try to cope with this on a sort of a ad hoc basis. Um, and I'm not real familiar with all of them. I, this list just came off the uh, Wikipedia page for the uh, article on abstract interpretation. This, you know, congruence relations on integers, uh, octagons, difference bound matrices, linear, linear inequalities. Um, and all these are just trying to um, cope with the, um, this imprecision. Another issue with uh, abstract interpretation is that it's, it's sort of a top down thing typically where you, uh, you can't, just look at a subprogram in isolation, uh, or, or at least a subprogram that has parameters and that references interesting state. Uh, you need a driver or a harness to sort of get things started, and then you, you process that, and then it, and then and then you look at the things that it calls and the things that it calls, and so it's, it's sort of a top-down, um, and you can get 
artifacts, at least in some cases where you know, some scenario wasn't exercised by your harness, and, 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 uh, and then you can get uh, um, problems stemming from that. So those are, those are two uh, drawbacks of this, this um, convex polyhedron approach and, and just this general approach of representing. So what Copier does is it chooses a different approach that eliminates both of these problems. Um, and the basic trick uh, is, it, it's old stuff, at least in, in the compiler world. Um, it uses uh, something called um, global value numbering, uh, which is related to something called single static assignment, um, which is, it's been around for years in, in the area of, of compiler optimization. It's used in uh, computing common, identifying common sub-expressions and doing value propagation, constant propagation. And uh, anyway, the idea is, is that, well, first you put things into uh, SSA, which is a single static assignment form. And the idea is there, it's, it's, is that there's only one assignment to any given object. And so suppose you had, say, an if statement that says uh, uh, x equals 10, x is assigned 10 in one arm, and x is assigned 20 in the other arm. Um, well, what that, if you're putting this into SSA, what happens is you would then say x1, you'd introduce sort of a, a family of variables and say x1 is assigned 10, and over here x2 is assigned 20. And then at the join point, when the two arms, after the if statement, when the two arms come back together, you would say x3 is assigned phi of x1 and x2. And, and phi is this oracular choice function that just magically says, it's, it's one of those. I'm not, I'm not gonna say which one, but it's, 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 it's one of those. And, and, and for purposes of data flow, um, th th that's, that, that gets you what you need. And as I say, this is a you know, well-established technique that's been around for a long time in compilers. Uh, but, but what's interesting here is using it um, in the context of, um, of, of static analysis tools. Um, oh, uh, well, anyway, so, so now you've got these things in static, in, 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 in um, single static assignment form. And then you can compute global value numbering where you go, which involves traversing it. And, and you look at all the expressions that occur and, and generate value numbers for them. And what's really interesting here that, I, that, I'm, that I'm leading up to is, is that, um, so if an expression occurs in your source, then it, then it, it, then it gets a, a value number, and that's going to be the domain of the map here. And instead of just looking at um, variables, as was done in the, in the classic approach to abstract interpretation, um, we're going to have these, these, these value numbers, which can be either just basic you know, var variables like x, or they can be more complex expressions like you know, y times 2 minus x. And that's what's going to occur in the, uh, uh, what we're going to be keeping track of, so that we, you can associate a set of possible values with these with each value number, and at, at any given point in the execution of the program, and because of this SSA, because the uh, because there's only uh, because it's a single assignment stuff, these value numbers don't change in t um, over time. But they but what we know about them does. So that for example, you could have a set of possible values, and then um, if you do a conditional jump, the set associated with um, say say your, your, your condition here is, is if y times 2 is greater than x. So in the then part, we know that, uh, that the expression uh, y times 2 minus x is a positive value, uh, quantity. And on the other hand, in the else part, we know that it's either 0 or negative. And so the, this, at different points in the program, the set of possible values for a value number, for a given value number, can, can change. And the other thing is that when you see a, a, a runtime check, um, you can assume that after the check, that whatever, whatever, can, whatever expression you were checking is true. So for example, if you were uh, doing an array indexing operation, then immediately following that, you can assume that the, uh, that the value that was used for indexing is in, the proper, is in the proper range, because if it wasn't, you wouldn't have gotten to that next statement. And uh, so checks and assertions can also cause the, uh, um, the set of values to, to associate with a value number to shrink. And so what that means is that now, instead of having this, this uh, Cartesian product business with, with, with polyhedrons and so on, um, the, the, uh, you just represent it using sort of what you would imagine. I mean, if I, if I know something about 
uh, x, then that might tell me something about x plus 3. And if I know something about x plus 3, that might tell me something about x. And so you, you propagate information back and forth just using the usual arithmetic and, and identities and, and whatnot. And, um, and so now you have a map from, from all the value numbers that occur in, your, in the subprogram that you're interested in to, to the set of uh, possible values for that particular value number. And you have one of these maps for each, for both the entry point and the exit point of each basic block in your program. So for example, um, this might be, uh, let's get my uh, pointer here. Uh, this might be an if statement where here's the condition and then, then this might be the then part and this might be the else part. And then maybe there's a loop here. And so this is the body, it might be the body of the loop and then it comes back up here. And, and then here's the join part where the two um, branches of the if come, uh, come back. And you, and you notice that the ones where there's more than one predecessor, uh, you, you might generate a fee expression here. For example, uh, if, if something was introduced in here and something was introduced in here, then we, then we might get a fee expression here that corresponds to uh, um, the join points as I described earlier. Um, but anyhow, you, you have this mapping both, well, at the, at the entry point of, of a basic block and at the exit point of a basic block, you have a mapping for value numbers to the possible sets that that value number it might have. And then you also, if you're in the middle of analyzing one particular block, as you're sort of walking through that block, you have a current map. And you know, when you get to the end, that's going to be the outgoing map. It starts out as the incoming map. And, and then you, uh, you uh, iterate until this all converges. And your sets are getting smaller, so it will eventually converge. And, and that's you know, how you deal with loops. Um, now, this is just a little uh, uh, high-level explanation of the, of the um, organization, the internal organization of, of code here. It takes an intermediate uh, representation called skill as input. I mean, you can, uh, the, the ADA front end takes ADA as the input and generates, and then we have a, a version of the ADA which, uh, front end which ge um, generates skill as its output, and then, that, and then from that point, uh, code here is sort of treated like just another back end for the compiler. Um, and then it does the object ID. That I, didn't, I haven't talked about arrays and the, all the complications associated with aliasing and whatnot. We're, for, to illustrate the point we're trying to make in this talk, we're, we'll pretty much focus on scalars. But um, as you might imagine, arrays and, and recursion and indirect calls, there's all sorts of complications. Um, and, and there's a phase that, and then, there, and then we get this uh, static single static assignment uh, global value numbering phase, which I described, which um, does the uh, does this, this iteration that I was just describing. And then PVP, or no, actually it sets it up. And then PVP is where the actual iteration occurs. The, uh, that's the po uh, possible value propagation, where it determines the set of possible values for each value number at each point in the program. And, um, and then a, a closer look at that uh, SSA global value numbering phase, we, you have to, Compute the dominator tree because that's, this is a classic uh, stuff from, from um, uh, just SSA theory. Um, for, for this is determining where you have to place the place the fees, and I'm not going to worry too much. But anyhow, it, it, it does the the fee placement, and then it does the uh, the global value numbering. Um, and as I say, yeah, as it says here, the um, so the, so you might. Uh, so if, 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 you ha if the source looks something like, you know, if x is greater than y, then max is x, else max is equal to y, then at the end, uh, the, rep the value for max might be this fee expression that, that's, um, um, that's going to be either x or y. I mean, that's, that's what it boils down to or what it's equivalent to. It would actually have all those, those you know, x1, x2, x3s, things that I was talking about earlier. Um, so... So you map every value uh, to, a, to a number, to a value set. And as I say, the, the, the flow back and forth, it doesn't require any of this Cartesian product stuff. It, it's, it's just uh, the, sort of you know the characteristics of an operator. And, and, you, and so when you know things ab about either the constituents of an expression, when you, as you get new knowledge about the constituents of an expression, then that tells you more about the val possible values of the expression and vice versa. And, um, and then you just iterate until you get a fixed point. And then if you find any ch um, check expressions 
where the possible value set includes any of the um, uh, values that would cause the check to fail, then those are the ones you complain about. Um, and it, it, as I say, it, it, it processes a basic block. It starts with the input set. Uh, you know, it starts it with the initial incoming mapping from value numbers to um, uh, to, pots of, to sets of possible values, and then walks through and, and sh shrinks the set based in, on checks and so on that it sees, and and then it computes the outgoing. And then there's an interesting um, uh, business where what you can and at the end sort of is a separate thing. You take all the check expressions, all the expressions that participated in checks, and you add new information. You say all those things are true. You just tell it. You know just news flash from, from the sky, uh, all, all, those, all those checks pass. And then, as I said, wh when you do value numbers uh, and you find out something new about one, then that can tell you new things about other things. And so then you work out the impact that that miraculous new piece of information um, had on value numbers that correspond solely to inputs to your program, either globals or parameters. And, and that becomes the preconditions. Those are precisely the values that survive based on the, assu the assumption that all your checks are going to pass. Um, those, it means that, it means that, and then you propagate that using the value number, you know, propagation stuff. Um, then it, whatever that tells you about the possible values for the inputs, uh, those becomes the precondition. And, the, and similarly, for the, you, you look at the exit block at the end and, um, and, and again, you look at the consequences of, of you know, telling it, all these checks are going to pass, and see what that tells you about the, uh, um, the, uh, the value numbers at the very end, of the, the outgoing values of the, in, of the exit block um, that correspond to globals. You, I mean, on the exit, you don't care about the states of things like local variables, because they're about to cease to exist anyway. Um, but. Um, but, but that becomes the post condition. So it's, 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 a, it's a neat way to, uh, to compute the preconditions and the post conditions for a uh, subprogram. And that can be valuable in its own right because uh, you know, you're, you're looking at the uh, output of, your, of, of running code here and it says, uh, oh, well, here's your program and here's the precondition. And, and, and it, it, the precondition is that this incoming parameter must not be 37 because if it is 37, it's not going to work. And, and, and you look at that and say, well, I mean, I really intended it for it to work for all cases. Uh, and, and so just the errors can be brought to your attention in that form by, uh, by identifying the pre and post conditions. Um, so this is an example that uh, I thought was uh, interesting. This is actually out output from CodePeer. Um, and this sort of shows the power, uh, of this, this illustrates a couple points about what I was talking about. We have this assertion, that, okay, we, we case on N. We have this incoming integer, uh, uh, a non-negative integer. Natural is a subtype of integer which says it's uh, not negative. And we have two out parameters, which A and B, which are also naturals. And so we case on the value of N, and if it's in this range, then A is assigned one, B is assigned two. And if it's in this range, then A is assigned 101 and B is assigned 102. And otherwise, A is assigned N minus 1 and B is assigned N. And, then, and at the end, we assert that B minus A equals 1, that the difference is, is 1. And um, there's some interesting points about this. Um, the, the fact that this check is here, that tells at a, says from a human point of view that that's an expression you're interested in. That's a property that, you, that, that you know, if, it, if it wasn't interesting to you, why did you write it? Um, but the fact that it occurs means that it gets a value number, which means it shows up in the domain of all these maps we've been talking about. And um, so that means that, uh, and as we see here in the, in the post condition that, that Copier generates for this example, it was able to prove B equals A plus one. And if you deleted that assertion from the code, that post condition goes away. So it's sort of the fact that you, meant that you, the fact that you mentioned that you were interested in that value had the side effect of, of, of causing that expression to uh, appear in the domain of these maps, and so it got tracked, and it was able to figure out at the, at, at the merge, it says, well, well, let's look at that value number. Um, oh, yeah, it was true at the exit of this one, and it was true at the exit of this one, and it was true at the exit of this one, so when we merge it all together, yeah, it's true. And, 
incidentally, if you use the uh, traditional convex um, polytope uh, representation, then the set of points, that, then, then a convex region which encloses all the possible values that A and B might have, that it would encloses the point one, two, uh, oh, I, I guess it would be a, a point in three space, you know, because N would be in there involved in this. But, but it, think of it just, for, let's ignore N for a moment. So it would have to enclose the point one, two, and it would have to enclose the point 101, 102, and it would have to enclose all the points of the form n minus 1, n that are not, where n is not in these two ranges. Um, but anyway, it turns out that the, um, that the convex region that encloses those things also encloses some points such that the difference between b and a is not 1. And so if, with that approach, that imprecision costs you. And using that approach, uh, it would be unable to uh, prove that this, to conclude that this assertion is guaranteed to succeed. So this is an example where the, uh, uh, this approach gets you more precise results than the, uh, um, than the, than the convex re n-dimensional regions uh, approach. Um, so plans we have for, uh, besides just using Copier as, as a, you know, <coughs> bug finder, um, uh, in the future, we plan to, um, well, we have this thing, uh, um, Spark, which is, a, I mentioned earlier, which is a, a verification condition. It uses SMT lib and, and theorem proving, and, and uh, it's, a, it's a deductive system. Um, and in some cases, it's kind of overkill. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's very powerful machinery, but, but sometimes it's expensive. And so the idea is to use Copier as a, as a preliminary filter where uh, Copier can more rapidly uh, prove uh, the success of a high percentage of the um, checks, and, and, then you, and then only the remaining checks would need to generate verification conditions that would be proved using the Spark technology. Um, and then carrying that approach one step further, uh, QGen is, a, uh, is an 80 core uh, model-based development pro uh, product. Which can be which can generate Mizu C or Spark from Simulink models, and one way to use it is you generate both, and you generate Mizu C to execute, and and Spark to do formal <coughs> verification, and uh, and then if and then if you believe that the translation that the, you know that the two are, are equivalent, then if you prove that there's no runtime errors in the Spark, then then that means you've proven something useful about the Mizu C. Um, and then again, having gone down that route, then you can use Copier, as I described earlier, as a pre-filter to make the uh, to improve the performance of the, of the Spark checking. Um, so anyhow, um, uh, abstract interpretation is 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 is, is good. <coughs> it, um, it can handle these big ranges because it manipulates sets. It's, it's not dealing with individual values. Um, and it avoids the, some of the state, spe state space explosion that you get with, uh, say, a lot of model checking techniques. Um, and it doesn't need help from the user to explicitly specify pre and post conditions or loop invariants <coughs> the way that um, um, the d deductive approaches often do. And actually, it's kind of interesting. Um, another possible way down the road thing is using Copier, since Copier is able to infer pre and post conditions, then you might be, you can imagine hooking the two systems up and, and, and so that the user would not need to provide pre and post conditions for Spark. Um, and then you, um, but, but you have this with the classic approach, you have this problem where you get imprecision in the, in the uh, and, you, and you're, in order to deal with the, the with the, um, making it computationally feasible, you, you have to introduce imprecision with this convex polytope model and, um, and it also has this top-down thing where it doesn't allow you to really deal with a, a, a subprogram. I mean, Copier is much more bottom-up. It, it, assuming that there's no cycles in the call graph, it, it, it processes a, a, a subprogram, a leaf subprogram, and then infers contracts for that. So it know, now it knows pre and post conditions. And then it never looks at the body of that subprogram again. When it processes another subprogram that calls the first one, it would just um, use the contract information, the pre and post conditions and whatnot that it had already computed during its analysis. And if there are cycles in the call graph, then you have to iterate. And that's, an, that's an, another level of iteration that's different from the one I already talked about earlier during the, during the PVP phase. Um, 
So, but anyhow, so, so you get this, this uh, thing where it, it's not, it doesn't require this, this top-down thing with a harness. And, um, and you get this with the value number things, the, uh, precisely the expression that you're interested in because they occurred in your source program um, are the ones where it, it computes the most precise information because those end up in the domain of the, of the, of the value number map. And, uh, so that, that's, that's it. Any questions? Questions? One, two, three. Fun stuff. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Thank you.